In the Baltic Sea, bubbles caused by a mega underwater gas leak. Filmed by the Danish military, the gas is escaping from three points on Russia's Nord Stream pipelines. The mysterious damage seemingly happening just hours apart. If, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. We do not yet know the details of what happened at Nord Stream, but we can clearly see that it is an act of sabotage, an act that probably marks the next stage in the escalation of the situation we are dealing with in Ukraine. So the Feast of Trumpets is behind us, and many are asking, what now and why are we still here? I would like to give a quick update to encourage those who are watching with me for our bridegroom's return. Looking back at history, we know that 2022 is a Shemitah year. In 2015, the world not only witnessed the rare blood moon tetrad after the understanding of these came to light around 2012, but this also marked seven years of plenty that followed with stock markets reaching highs in the seven years that followed that were never seen before in history. Seven years before 2015, in 2008, we had the financial crisis associated with cheap credit and lax lending standards that fueled a housing bubble. Another seven years before that, we had 9-11 in 2001, marking the start of people's freedoms being taken away. So it is pretty easy to see the seven-year Shemitah cycles when we consider recent history. What may be a little more difficult to identify are the Jubilee years that follow every seventh Shemitah cycle, and 2022 and 2023 would seem to mark the start of a Jubilee year. Now when it comes to Jubilee years, it is important to know that things play out a little differently in these than with the 49 years that preceded them, and I would like to show you what God's Word has to say about them, and how these are also connected to the Biblical harvest, which I discuss in many videos. The Hebrew New Year of Rosh Hashanah is announced on the Feast of Trumpets, and we read about that in the following passage. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. What I find interesting is that the instructions regarding our Heavenly Father's feast days are found in the same chapter where the harvest model is explained to us, showing us that for us to correctly understand the feasts of the Lord, we also need to understand God's harvests. So a new year is announced on the first day of the seventh month, but for a jubilee year, the year of jubilee is not announced on the first day of the month, but on the tenth day, which is also the day of atonement, and this only happening on a jubilee year. It is also interesting to see how the Jubilee year is announced, and it is explained to us in the following passage. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, and the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. So when it comes to a jubilee year, a final trumpet is sounded on the Day of Atonement to announce the year of jubilee. And this may very well be the last trump that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15, which also explains to us how those who are part of the first resurrection can be identified when we understand God's harvest model. What is further interesting to note is that God's word tells us about the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles starting five days after the Day of Atonement, or in a jubilee year, five days after the trumpet sounded that announced the jubilee year. Have a look at this. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Also in the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. In verse 39 of Leviticus 23, the day is associated with the completion of harvest, which means that the owner of a field would have gathered in his harvest before the 15th of this month. And based on what we read in other books of God's word, our Redeemer's ingathering of his harvest is associated with a trumpet blast that on a jubilee year would point us to the day of atonement. That harvest event is described to us in Revelation 14, where the following is written. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. What is very interesting about this passage is that the word that is used for ripe actually means withered away. And I've shared in two previous videos about the vision in which Linda Courtney was shown the withered portion of God's harvest being removed from the earth, while the healthy plants were left behind. If you have not seen these yet, you are welcome to watch these two videos. So what does it mean when God's word shows us that the harvest that he is about to harvest is dried up and withered away? Well, is this not the condition of plants that one would expect to see standing in the field when the farmer delays gathering in his crop? Our Heavenly Father explains to us in his word that he will wait longer than one would expect to gather in those that belong to him. Be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. When we consider the early rains, and how these were poured out over God's harvest, we can also understand how the latter rains will be poured out, because there is a repeating pattern involved. I have discussed this in a previous video, specifically this one, and I would recommend that you watch it in the little time that remains if you have not seen it yet. Suffice to say that those who will be part of the rapture will also represent the latter rain, just as the first fruits of this harvest represented the early rains that prepared the early harvest for the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, the remainder of the harvest, or the strong plants, or the gleanings, will be prepared by the latter rain for the next outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as well as for the tribulation that will follow, even though it may be shortened. So from what I see from God's word, and I could of course be wrong, we have a window of time between September 30th and October 5th, depending on the calendar that one uses, in which the trump of God could sound, and where the dead in Christ will be resurrected, and those who are alive and who belong to Jesus will be changed and caught up into heaven. These will then be returned to the earth for a time to work the remainder of the harvest before finally ascending into heaven before God's judgment is poured out over this world. This will follow the same pattern of Jesus and those who were resurrected with him who appeared unto many in Jerusalem for forty days before they ascended into heaven as the first fruits of God's harvest and leading to the persecution of the early church that started right after that. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. This appearance unto many by those who received their glorified bodies, and who represent the first fruits of the harvest, prepared the early harvest for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. The latter rain will be poured out over the gleanings in a similar way, but will in this instance no longer be limited to Jerusalem only. It will cover the entire world and will see revival at a scale never witnessed before on the earth. 
If we look at the situation in the world right now, we can see that we are getting very close to the next world war breaking out. Just yesterday, the Nord Stream pipelines were sabotaged, and even this has been shown to us through predictive programming as being part of the enemy's plan. On this cover of The Economist magazine for the world in 2019, we see Putin's pipelines being mentioned, written in reverse. But this is all part of our enemy's plan to bring about a situation in the world that will allow the Antichrist to step forward. Earlier this year, the US pointed out that if Russia invaded Ukraine, they would ensure that the pipelines are taken out of the equation. And one has to wonder then, who is behind the attacks on the pipelines that occurred yesterday? If, uh, if Russia invades... Uh that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. The first leak was reported on the never-opened Nord Stream 2 line on Monday, east of the island of Bornholm. Then on Tuesday, two leaks were found on the nearby Nord Stream 1, with Swedish scientists detecting explosions. We know very well what an underwater blast looks like. And so in this case, there's no doubt this is not an earthquake. This is a blast that has been occurring in the water column or close to the bottom. In addition, Russia just concluded a referendum in the eastern territories of Ukraine to determine whether those territories should be annexed and become part of Russia. And from the results presented, it would seem that there is no other option but to annex these territories. Russia has also stated that if these territories are annexed, that nuclear doctrine would apply to them and any attack on these by others would be seen as attacks on Russia itself and could invoke the use of unconventional weapons of mass destruction against those attackers. I think you will agree with me that it is just a matter of days at this point before we see a serious escalation in the ongoing conflicts around the world, but specifically those involving Russia given the events that have occurred over the past few days. As we continue to watch, I hope that this will encourage those who have decided to patiently wait for the return of our Redeemer, no matter the cost or severity of the attacks that they have to endure, just as in the days of Noah. In this late hour, many are still scoffing and mocking, but will soon realize that they wasted the many opportunities provided to get into the ark that would have protected them from what is coming. But even this has been shown to us in God's word, and so it has to be. This is probably the last warning to change the path that you are on, if you are one of those who love to scoff and to mock at those who are waiting for the return of their bridegroom. I look forward to seeing all of my brothers and sisters in Christ in the air before our Savior really soon. And if we have to wait a little longer, then that is fine too. God bless.